This past Tuesday night, I and eight others stood vigil on the square in Marietta, hoping and praying that a man's life would be spared. Later that evening, six burly guards and many other employees from the Georgia Department of Corrections participated in a ritual of execution. They escorted an elderly, frail, compliant black man to an execution chamber. They pinned him to a gurney. They strapped him down in uniform precision. They offered a prayer. They injected poison into his groin and waited for him to die. All while a gaggle of spectators looked on in rapt attention. The Marietta Daily Journal reporter who witnessed and reported these events said that there were ample vomit bags available. Not for the person being executed, mind you, but for those looking on. How kind. I wanted to throw up myself, but more importantly, I wanted to know where were the tissues for those witnesses who, in my estimation, should be sobbing that this is the best a civilized society can do. When I chose this sermon topic before I left on sabbatical, I had no idea that I would be provided such a visceral and timely example that must leave us asking ourselves, why do we punish? And why do we punish the way we do? This sermon is not about the death penalty. I have preached my passionate opposition to the death penalty five years ago. The sermon is not about racial inequity in our criminal justice system. I preached that sermon a year ago. But there is one thing that this sermon shares with those other sermons. They are about our character as a people. They speak to the very heart of who we are as a people. As I speak about criminal punishment, I I wonder how many of us have a clear idea about why we send people to prison, criminals to prison. What purpose does it serve? What do we hope to accomplish? Do we have any idea what happens to the lives of men and women in prison while we are not paying attention? I believe there are valid reasons for incarceration. But how conscious are we of what is being done in our name? Are our values being reflected in the criminal justice system? I suspect that most people have some vague notion about punishment. We might even come up with something on the spot about why we punish. But I still wonder how many of us are clear with ourselves about why we, and it is we, put people behind bars. David Shostakis, a trial attorney, says there are essentially four reasons that people to varying degrees give for punishing criminals. The first on his list is retribution or revenge. I was surprised to see them together. They're the first reason in his list. Retribution simply means that people must be punished for their wrongdoings. It is a lesson we learn early in life. Most children are taught that wrongdoing is followed by punishment. I've often wondered if the idea of retribution is is a remnant, a leftover, if you will, of a belief in a vengeful God. You do something wrong, you deserve to be punished, is the lesson we learn. But wrongdoing and punishment as cause and effect seems rather shallow to me. If that's all there is, is there not something more we can hope for? I was actually surprised to see revenge listed with retribution as a reason for criminal punishment. 
But Shostakos reminds us that in many cultures, revenge restores equity when a person has been wronged. And criminal punishment by the state serves as a substitute for this, thus making personal revenge unnecessary. And yet I see revenge as having no redeeming value whatsoever. Speaking practically, I like Gandhi's response, an eye for an eye makes the whole world blind. And speaking spiritually, I again ask, is there not something better we can hope for? I will also suggest that revenge is childish. And I mean that literally. In child development, children can be very concrete in which an act of wrongdoing is responded to by the identical act in reverse. And in contemporary culture, the death penalty is such an example. The punishment must fit the crime. If you take a life, you forfeit your own. It is very concrete, and I think it is also very shallow. Shostakas offers a second reason for criminal punishment. It is deterrence. Punishment, the theory goes, is intended to deter a person from repeating the act. And public executions were and are intended to deter others from committing similar crimes. Does deterrence work? I suppose that fear of a hefty fine or worse does influence my driving. <laughs> but I hope there are other reasons that motivate me to be a good driver. I think about safety for myself and others. And when my young son was in the car, I thought about setting a good example for him. And today I, I ask myself, why why am I in such a rush? All of this is to say that I hope fear of punishment is at the bottom of a list for a reason for why we act as we do. And for more serious crimes, it is well documented that capital punishment does not serve as a deterrent. Let's be clear about that. A third reason for Punishment for criminal punishment is public safety. There are some individuals who cannot live freely in society out of fear that they will harm others. This is not for medical reasons, but it is rather for those committing serious crimes or for repeat offenders. Of course, the $64,000 question is, what happens to them after they're incarcerated? Do we throw away and throw away the key? Lock the door and throw away the key. Rehabilitation is the final reason Shatakas gives for criminal punishment. Whether it is incarceration or other punishment, the idea is to create an opportunity for rehabilitation. It is the hope and belief that it is possible to correct errant behaviors. What is clear to me is that we do not all start life or have life experiences on an even playing field. That is to say, there are any number of reasons that some people are more inclined to commit crimes than others. Rehabilitation attempts to correct this inequity. It may occur through counseling. It may occur through teaching a skill or trade that can produce income or enhance self-esteem. It is curious to me that in Shostakis' article... Only in his discussion of rehabilitation does he mention the value that every human life has meaning and worth. He mentions it as a motivating factor for rehabilitation. Now given that this is Unitarian Universalism's first principle, it is obvious that rehabilitation will score much higher for us. And you have probably already gleaned from my gleaned that from my running commentary that I offered of the four reasons cited for criminal punishment. Of the four reasons I just listed, I want to argue that they essentially collapse into two. That is two overarching motivations for punishing criminals. In the first, 
There are those forms of punishment that are prescriptive and simplistic. In this mentality, you will hear such phrases as, you, if you do the crime, you do the time. Three strikes and you're out and mandatory minimums. There is little, if any, consideration for a hopeful outcome. Only a bruising penalty with the misguided intent to force a criminal into submission. Instill fear and in extreme cases and sadly not so extreme cases, simply remove the criminal from society or from life itself. This camp is unable to tolerate a system that might be perceived as soft or where a criminal might repeat a crime because efforts at rehabilitation are imperfect and will always involve an element of risk. To me, these prescriptive and simplistic forms of punishment are rooted in fear. Alternatively, there are those options that are creative and compassionate. They are rooted not in fear, but I believe in hope. These options are not singularly concerned with meeting out punishment, bullying someone into submission, but rather working tirelessly to seek change in behavior, even for the most heinous of crimes. This camp is concerned not just with the well-being of society, but also with the well-being of the individual committing the crime. It has a vision of an individual and a society made whole. Not by isolation or extermination, but by healing. Of the two perspectives I just described, we have seen significant swings in the last hundred years. There have been times of horrific abuse of prisoners so poignantly seen in our choir's selection this morning. Some of these systematic abuses are not that far in the past. And we also know that abuse of prisoners' physical, mental, verbal, are not isolated incidents, and they occur up to the present day. Throughout the history of our nation, we have seen remarkable times of increased interest in the humane treatment and rehabilitation of the prisoner. Sadly, much of this fell away in the 1970s and 80s. Today, with the prison population growing out of control, thankfully, we are seeing some reevaluation, minuscule at best, but some reevaluation of the criminal justice system. But sadly, it is based more on economics of having too many prisoners rather than the worth and dignity of a human being. The privatization of prisons has further complicated the situation. It has turned the prison system into an economic enterprise. The needs of the prisoner, and I would say the needs of the community, are completely subsumed, subsumed by the needs of a corporation. But let's not blame the corporation too quickly. The corporation could just as easily be one that focuses on rehabilitation with all the right incentives for minimizing recidivism. If we are going to invest in our criminal justice system, we don't need to do so by building more prisons. We need to do so by investing in programs that rebuild lives. You'll notice that I've not offered any statistics this morning. I do that. I do that because I think you know the situation adequately enough. And to be candid, I have no interest in marshalling statistics with you. My interest is in exploring a more fundamental question. What kind of society do we wish to create? I ask this because our prison system reflects who we are, what our values are, and what we ultimately want to achieve. Here I cite not only our Unitarian Universalist first principle, but I am also deeply moved by the teachings of an ancient Jewish prophet who warned against a society that has lost its way. And I am equally motivated 
by an itinerant Jewish rabbi who taught us to be genuinely concerned for those who are seen as the scourge of society. I realize that these are not new issues for us, and yet I believe the stakes are as high as they have ever been. I believe that we are fighting not only for the well-being of inmates, but the, for the very heart of our community, our own hearts as well. What moves us? How are our hearts speaking to us in this situation? At the worship council meeting this week, we all jokingly talked about gloom and doom sermons. I thought and even said out loud, like the one I'm going to give this Sunday. I've been pretty critical up to this point, pretty harsh. But in my heart of hearts, I don't believe this is a gloom and doom sermon. From the deepest place I know, I know that I want to stand up here, I want to stand with you and advocate for a society that is not ruled by fear, but instead is governed by and inspired by hope and healing. I want our prison system to be governed by the value that celebrates the worth and dignity of every person that holds hope for each inmate. I want our prison system to be one that values restoration and returning productive members to society rather than one known for isolation of those who we jettison aside and neglect. In our child dedication ceremony here at Emerson, we ask the parents to consider the world not as it is, but as it could be. And that is the role that Emerson has to play. Our vision statement speaks to, of Emerson as a source of peace, hope, and healing. And we do that well inside these walls. But this vision has the potential to only serve us. And when that happens, as is obvious, we are only serving ourselves. As our closing hymn and our chalice extinguishing will say, let us take our vision out into the world. May it be so.